right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really excited to be here. It's quite an honor for many levels. I'm really thankful Catherine invited me to be part of this wonderful panel. Um, I feel like I've learned a lot sitting here. And also, I'm very thankful for the Landmarks folks and the Alabama Department of Archives and History for hosting this event. I think it's really um, interesting now that I start to talk about Tom Owen. Uh, Tom Owen would be very proud of an event like this. In many ways, this is kind of the vision that Tom Owen had many, many years ago and that we're kind of carrying out. Um, you know, in some ways, my presentation is kind of the end of the story to a certain degree because we're getting into a different era of history, but also it's really sort of the beginning of a much larger story that we're all part of, actually. Um, you know, and so, you know, this is a story of kind of Tom Owen's creation of that. So, you know, one cannot overstate Tom Owen's impact on it. Am I doing something? I'm not going to scoot back Oh, there we go. All right. We'll reboot that. All right. One cannot overstate Thomas Owen's uh, impact on Alabama history. The very institution where we have gathered today is in many ways the result of Owen's unique vision and dogged perseverance. While Owen is recognized as the founder of Alabama Department of Archives and History, that monumental achievement was just one result of a substantially larger idea that nearly 100 years after his passing continues to motivate many of us who are gathered here today. Um, perhaps probably his biggest uh, contribution when it doesn't get brought up all the time is he really represents this big shift from the scholarly gentleman, which we've seen a lot of today, to more of sort of a professional practitioner. You know, as history kind of leaves sort of the amateurish, I'm just fascinated in this and trying to settle old scores kind of stuff into more of a scientific exploration of the past to a certain degree. And Owen's definitely a part of that. Not only did Owen build the Alabama archives, the first of its kind in American history, but he set a high standard for the role that scholars and history enthusiasts should aspire to play among broader segments of our citizenry. Even today, we have much to gain from a closer examination of his broad and ambitious range of activities. And mainly, you know, like at lunch today, you could see some of what Tom Owen had kind of envisioned. You know, we're all sitting in a room. We come from different places in Alabama. We all have different interests. Uh, some of us are more interested in historic preservation. Some of us are just here because they're interested in Native American history. But we're sitting around talking and collaborating and learning how we can work together and build alliances to further the thing that we're interested in, which is history. That's why we're all here on a Saturday afternoon <laughs> where we could be in many other places, right? Well, Tom Owen, many years ago, long before these kinds of places were built, he was envisioning that kind of world. And so I think he'd be really sort of excited about where we are today. Not only did Tom Owen create and participate in the development of numerous organizations and archival and museum projects, his life work established a model for subsequent publicly facing scholars or public historians, a group of scholars determined to make academic quality scholarship accessible to public audiences through a variety of mediums, including the building of archival collections, museum exhibits, public programs, historic sites, and more. Owen's fingerprints touched all of these activities. Thus, in many ways, Owen was Alabama's first public historian. Owen understood that the future of Alabama's history depended on generating public interest and support, building networks of passionate, committed historians and constituents, and transforming those passions into institutions that could develop best practices and standards that gave an air of professionalism to what had been a recreational pursuit before that. Prior to Owen, Alabama historians lacked the infrastructure necessary to develop statewide institutions capable of identifying, preserving, and interpreting the state's cultural resources. To be sure, there were individuals across Alabama dedicated to preserving and documenting history prior to and during Owen's lifetime. However, Owen was among the best and certainly the most successful at seeing these individual pieces as part of a larger whole. Sometimes in history, uh, you know, we all get caught up in what we care about the most, um, our individual passions, and we don't often think about how those connect with a much broader world of history around us. Owen was great at that. Owen was great at listening to people who care about a variety of things and then finding a way to build a coalition with that to kind of build the types of institutions that he uh, sort of dreamt of. Um, Owen saw himself as the hub, basically, which connected all of Alabama's numerous spokes to form a wheel that enabled these parts to work as a single 
tool in concert with one another. Perhaps Owen's most significant and lasting contribution to Alabama history has been the infrastructure that he left behind. An infrastructure that capitalized upon existing local interest in history to build a statewide network of publicly oriented professionals and scholars that combined to create institutions capable of garnering public and private fiscal support for a range of activities. From this perspective, the Alabama Archives history is part of a much larger system, a system that Owen uh, generated. And we all know, we've all had projects that we wanted to get off the ground, uh, you know, in your local area. You want to do oral history projects, you want to preserve a historic house. We all know how hard it is to get that off the ground, right? You know, to raise money, to get public officials interested in what you're doing, to gain some type of lobbying effort to make that happen. If anything we learn about Tom Owen uh, today is that Tom Owen was the master at that. And Tom Owen was really understanding that it takes more than just kind of a passion to something to make it happen. You have to have a plan and sort of a collaborative spirit to make it happen. Sometimes that means giving up part of what you're interested in to make sure other things happen uh, in the way. You know, um, he was great at that, uh, you know, raising money for that. And he was also really good at connecting the politics to all of this, the politics of public history. It takes more than just passion, as we know. It takes lobbying legislatures. It takes getting public funds. It takes all sorts of kind of private donations and public donations to make things happen. Owen was great at doing that. Yet, Owen was far from perfect. His flaws also shaped how future historians interpreted Alabama history. In many ways, Owen was a man of his times who shared many of the same prejudices and biases as many other white Alabama men of his generation. While we can certainly learn a lot about Owen and Alabama history from what he collected and his writings, what he failed to collect or failed to focus on also tells us much about the practice of history in the Jim Crow era South, as well as the period's views of women, Native Americans, and various political movements that challenged Alabama's dominant Democratic Party at the time. Owen's story, therefore, unfortunately, is also filled with numerous uh, missed opportunities. And it's so important uh, in Alabama, Owen is much celebrated for the creation of the institution where we are today. But, you know, it's really important to put him in the broader context of that progressive era period because he is really being shaped by things that are going on around the country. He's picking up things that are happening in the country and bringing them back to Alabama and kind of applying them in a unique way here. But he's just one piece of a much larger story um, happening here. So sometimes, you know, kind of see uh, Owen as being perhaps exceptional when really he's just part of a much larger uh, kind of group here. Um, so it's difficult to separate uh, Tom Owen's professional activity from his deep personal interest in the American Civil War. While Owen was interested in many topics of Alabama history and archaeology, the Civil War was his passion. However, I would argue that Tom Owen was far from your typical promoter of the lost cause ideology that so pervaded Southern attitudes and historical accounts during his lifetime. Lost cause adherents generally believed that the Civil War had little to do with slavery, Confederate defeat was the result of the Union's superior resources, and that the war had brought to an end a unique and superior civilization that best represented the constitutional ideals and values of the nation's founders. We might expect Owen to be highly influenced by this growing civic religion, but a closer look reveals a more complicated story. Thomas Owen was born in 1866 in Jefferson County, Alabama. His father, William Marmaduke Owen, love Marmaduke, that's a great name. I should have named my son Marmaduke, you know, had served in the Confederate Army throughout the war. In 1864, during the Battle of Atlanta, his father had been captured, sent to Johnson's Island Prison Camp in Sandusky, Ohio, where he remained for the duration of the war. Like most Civil War prisoners who survived the war, Owen returned home, bit me, emaciated and embittered by his wartime captivity. Many years later, Tom Owen penned a handful of brief accounts of his father's memories of the war. The accounts told stories of atrocities committed by his Federal Army jailers. Certainly as a child growing up in the Reconstruction era, uh, south, oops, I'm going to slide ahead. Reconstruction era South, um, you know, period filled with political and racial tensions that were high. The stories shared by his father and those by other ex-Confederates in the community formed his initial forays into history. In fact, years later, some of Tom Owen's initial exchanges with Alabama Polytechnic Institute uh, history professor George Petrie were retellings of some of his Reconstruction era memories. 
Um, you know, Petrie's most known for really bringing Alabama football, you know, a history professor, so forth. But I would argue here today, one of the most important things Petrie did it was his interactions with Owen. He and Owen communicated quite a bit with one another. They were very familiar and friendly with one another. And Petrie had a profound impact on how Owen viewed history, how history should be done. Um, and the idea to create an archive in many ways comes from some of the sort of lessons he would have learned from, uh, from Petrie. Um, those conversations that he had with Petrie were shared with and continued through additional correspondence with one of Petrie's most promising students, Walter Linwood Fleming, who used such conversations as the basis for much of his Civil War and Reconstruction in Alabama that was published in 1905. Today, Fleming is mostly known as one of the major historians who promoted the infamous Dunning School interpretation of Reconstruction, an interpretation that largely blames federal interference, Republican construction, corruption, and African Americans for the failures of Reconstruction. However, though, um, during his time, Fleming was about as objective as any Southern historian born during this period who tackled this topic on, a, on a, any type of real uh, analytical kind of way. Uh, foremost, he openly acknowledged that the defense of slavery had motivated Alabama's secession from the Union, and he published a well-known set of period documents that included writings from several African Americans critical of white Alabamians' handlings of Reconstruction. In fact, W.B. Du Bois, who was very critical of uh, Fleming's writings in many other ways, actually commented one time that compared to most, you know, we'll have to put that aside there, Fleming had an honest approach to the subject, basically. Um, you know, and so, you know, Fleming, like I said, he's flawed, and so is Owen to some degree. But there's a big difference, and we've talked about this already today. In the antebellum period, for the most part, slaves are just kind of left out of the story. They're almost omitted. They're invisible to a certain degree. Even in our architecture, like at Monticello, slaves are made to sort of be invisible to some, some degree. Well, Fleming acknowledges African Americans. He sees them as actors. Now, they're actors who are disrupting Southern plans and hopes for reconstruction after the war, but they're there. They're at least there. Um, they're, they're sort of the main players in victimizing Southerners, but at least they're there. And, you know, a lot of Southern historians have made the point that that's a major step forward. They're at least there. You know, they're at least there. Petrie and Fleming had a profound influence on Tom Owen. During the 1890s, the time in which Owens was beginning to organize efforts to revive the dormant Alabama Historical Society, there were significant changes happening in universities nationwide that would forever change the study of history. College faculty such as Petrie were the first generation of American historians trained using the German seminar method that had been introduced to America during the 1870s. The seminar method emphasized the use of primary source documents, materials created from the period under study, and classroom discussions of history. Even lectures were supposed to be heavily rooted in primary source materials that students could access and interpret as part of their study of history. The seminar method placed a greater emphasis on documenting evidence and drawing clear connections between historical interpretation and evidence. In some ways, this was an effort to transform the study of history into a science and with methods capable of producing reproducible results. If history were to become a science, however, though, then it would need to build an archives to serve as its laboratory for that science. Meanwhile, as the teaching of history evolved in American universities, historians were making significant strides toward building a professional culture and standardizing best practices in an effort to better define the activities and scholarship they performed. In 1884, the American Historical Association formed to provide a national network for history professionals. Among the association's many goals was a campaign to promote the development of publicly accessible archival collections to house the primary sources that the new breed of scientific historians needed to complete their work. The American Historical Association also launched efforts to survey the extant historic records and rare books across the nation and appointed state representatives to manage these large survey projects locally. The result produced an enormous wave of energy across the country as efforts to document historical materials led to additional gathering and acquisition of materials by private and public entities. In most states, the person the American Historical Association appointed to conduct the state survey then made contacts with individuals, often like county judges and stuff, in local communities who could then lead efforts to survey their local records. 
This action usually led to formations of historical societies or, or the revitalization of dormant historical societies as these surveys kind of took root and people really started getting involved and in kind of documenting what was kind of in the basements and in the courthouses of the, all across Alabama. By the mid-1890s, uh, across the country, there was an incredible interest in identifying and reporting local historical collections. Thomas Owen was a byproduct of this larger national movement. As a student at the University of Alabama during the 1880s, Owen took several history courses in preparation for his law degree. Courses were taught by faculty who had been trained using that German seminar method. In those classrooms, Owen, who according to university records was kind of above average student, um, learned the value that historians placed on primary source records. He also learned that historians need to investigate different sets of records, often from individuals with different perspectives, in order to build impartial scientific interpretations. At the time, he would have been taught that the study of history was capable of achieving truths through extensive research. Historiography. You know, the study of history and the study of previous writings suddenly was born and became extremely important and would have been really central to his education at the time. Owen would have also been painfully aware that Alabama, like most other American communities, lacked central depositories uh, for these historical materials. During his time at the University of Alabama, most of the historic records that he could access were in private hands, often in small collections amassed by faculty, or on occasion sets of records found in local courthouses. Also, the university library amassed a small collection of unprocessed materials that were often stored in random drawers, shelves, and in basements and buildings all across campus. Owen also benefited from the relationship with his University of Alabama professor, Thomas McCorvey. McCorvey taught a wide array of courses, including philosophy and law. McCorvey had a deep interest in Alabama history. Outside the classroom, he compiled many historic maps, papers, and other items. He was especially interested in Native American history, particularly the Moundville site. During Owen's time at the University of Alabama, he certainly would have been influenced by McCorvey's extra-legal pursuits, and later in life referred to McCorvey as a role model. The two remained in constant contact, basically for the rest of Owen's life. Meanwhile, Owen, whose interest in history appeared to have dealt long before he stepped foot on that college campus, would have also been aware of the absence of an active statewide historical organization in Alabama. Back in 1850s, we looked at here a little bit earlier, the creation of the Alabama Historical Society. Albert Pickett, Alabama's most prominent historian at the time, served as the society's vice president. Pickett hoped that the society would gather historic materials from across the state and develop a central library, preferably in Tuscaloosa, uh, so that future scholars, quote, will not be subjected to the labor which it has been my lot to undergo in writing his thing. It's a pain in the tail to do historic research back in those days. During the 1850s, the society struggled to build membership and failed to produce the frequency of publications on Alabama history that its founders had envisioned. Perhaps it's fortunate, though, that they were such a failure, though, because during the Civil War in 1862, Confederate soldiers um, took over one of the buildings where they were storing these records that they had gained in some of these publications and basically trashed most of them <laughs> during their time there. A lot of the stuff was lost, so maybe a good thing the original historical so society didn't work out quite so well. Um, the society was dormant, basically, from the start of the Civil War through the mid-1870s. After showing signs of activity and growth during the 1870s and early 1880s, the Alabama Historical Society showed little sign of activity until the late 1890s when Tom Owen revived this organization. And he's going to revive it for different reasons than the original founders had to some degree. After graduating from the University of Alabama in 1887, Owen opened a law practice in Bessemer, Alabama. He immediately cast an eye towards politics, rising to assume a leading executive position in the Jefferson County Democratic Party and attaining office of chief county solicitor. <laughs> However, his legal and political career was overshadowed by his growing obsession with history. In 1889, Owen began amassing an impressive private collection that began with a handful of University of Alabama student publications, but soon blossomed in one of the state's most significant libraries. Owen scoured the state in search of rare books and private manuscripts. His books include copies of many of the works of the historians we've described here today. Um, that was his real interest and personal pursuit. Also, just correspondence with those historians who were still alive. He amassed that as well. 
um, you know, for example, for Pickett, um, you know, he acquired a lot of Pickett's notes, some of his research materials, and also some unpublished drafts, basically, of Pickett's work that really kind of reveal sometimes uh, much of the mind of Albert Pickett. Um, Owen's collection was vast in scope and interest. He gathered the papers of temperance organizations, Masonic lodges, private academies, public universities, ministerial records, military records, and more. Aware that many Alabamians had migrated to Alabama from Georgia and South Carolina during the 1830s and 40s, Owen traveled to those states to gather materials from areas where many Alabamians originated. He also gathered an impressive collection of rare maps, newspapers, and business account books. All of this material would eventually become the foundational collections housed by the Alabama archives. Owen quickly realized that there were others in Alabama who were also building private collections. He engaged in an extensive correspondence to identify those individuals and acquire a list of bibliographies. Usually he wanted them to give them his or give him their materials. You can understand most people don't want to give up their private collections, but he did us a favor in some degrees, though, because at least he said, well, if you're not going to give it to me, can I at least make a list of what you have? And he kept to those lists. And so he slowly compiled this massive bibliography of what's out there in the state of Alabama, a period where that's not centralized there. Um, like I said, by the early 1890s, Owen had almost single-handedly conducted the most extensive archival survey um, in Alabama history and perhaps even American history up to that time. Unfortunately, the time that he devoted to this history damaged his legal career and really dwindled his own personal resources. I mean, he really was kind of a bit of a failure. Also, something that was mentioned today that's really important, people are coming into Alabama from other places collecting materials already, and Owen saw that as well. And he understood that that was also a potential threat to the future of Alabama history. Um, so in some ways, uh, in some of his letters, I was reminded as the person said that, in some of his letters there is a certain amount of urgency to things because he's worried about materials leaving the state. And once they leave the state, how do you tell Alabama's story from you know, Wisconsin or something like that? It was during this period that Owen met his future wife, Marie Bankhead. Marie was the daughter of Alabama Congressman and future Senator John H. Bankhead. She too was well connected across the state, belonging to several women's clubs and genealogical organizations. The Bankheads were not impressed by Tom Owen's career trajectory. <laughs> yeah, he, was, he was not there. In fact, her diaries are really cool if y'all looked at them. They're just amazing and it really shows uh, a lot about her. I know she has a reputation of kind of being dogged and sometimes her reputation is from later in her life, but her diaries really reveal her earlier part of her life. And there's a bit of a, I don't want to overstate this, but a bit of a softer side to Marie Bankhead Owen um, in, this, in this work. Like I said, the Bankheads weren't too happy that their daughter fell in love with Tom Owen, a kind of bankrupt lawyer who's going all over the state collecting history. Uh, John Bankhead tried to dissuade his daughter from marrying Owen, who at times seemed to drift and dominated from, by his uh, historical pursuits. Maria, however, was deeply in love with Tom Owen, and with all her well-known dogged determination, convinced her father that the two would make a perfect match. Marie's diary described their 1894 wedding day as the happiest day of her life. Marriage not only brought the love of a woman into Owen's life, but also provided him access to Bankhead's growing political influence and money. Uh, he married well, <laughs> you know, to say the least. Uh, it, it helps to marry well. <laughs> like any good son-in-law, Owen promptly asked his father-in-law for help finding a job in Washington, D.C. With a congressional nepotism hard at play, uh, Tom got a job as a postal clerk, and the newlyweds moved to Washington, D.C. Despite his relocation, Owen remained devoted to gathering materials related to Alabama history. In D.C., Owen spent much of his time outside of work, combing through the Library of Congress, networking with the folks who were working there, networking with congressmen from different states who he would then get names and then write to people in those states trying to get materials related to Alabama history. You know, Owen was a master networker. You know, he met numerous historians during his time in D.C., and he helped create the Southern History Association, you know, an organization devoted to publishing historical accounts of Hubs Southern history, as well as making surveys of rare books and manuscript collections. Owen also at the time became a very active member in the American Historical Association. Um, Owen was great. He's kind of that guy who goes into a, a, an association and within a week he's like vice president or something. You know, we all know those people. You know, he's a really good climber in life. Well, master climber, okay? So, you know, he, he goes from being an unknown to basically being the preeminent historian of Alabama. Uh, the American Association of History, when they want to know something about Alabama, who they contact? They contact Tom Owen. 
He's a lawyer. <laughs> he's just a, he got a passionate interest. But he, so by the time he left D.C., he's known as kind of the Alabama historian. When Owen returned to Alabama in 1897, he had a plan in mind. Although he had to reopen a private law practice to generate income, and I say with quotes around it, he devoted most of his time toward a single goal, build a state-supported institution in Alabama that would house archival material similar to the Library of Congress's massive collections of books and publications. Initially, he hoped to use his family connections to lobby the state legislature to pass a bill calling for a state survey of extent records. But this is an important lesson of Owen. Sometimes people look at Owen and they say, well, he only got to where he got because he knew uh, Marie Bankhead Owen and John Bankhead and all these people helped him out. Little connections. That's not really true. Uh, when he first started, he had those connections and he failed. He actually failed several times to create his vision. He had to rethink things a little bit because all of his political connections weren't going to be enough to necessarily get him over the hump. And that's when he went out, just like groups like today, and tried to find constituents and partners to kind of work with uh, to help build his goal. Undeterred, Owen basically stopped his legal practice, something he could do because Marie Bankhead Owen could kind of privately fund him during most of this time. Um, and launched into a new effort to revitalize the dormant Alabama Historical Society. Owen reconnected with his former professor, Thomas McCorvey from Alabama, to devise a plan to use the society as a tool to lobby the legislature to fund the state archives. Owen wisely appointed Joseph F. Johnston, the governor of Alabama, as society president, something we still do today in many organizations. Go, go find a politician, put them at the head. What do they do? Eh, maybe not much, but at least they're there. And Joseph F. Johnston's presence really brought folks and brought some weight to what he was doing. Um, and then he started this massive campaign of extending out membership invitations, writing to hundreds and hundreds of people, trying to convince them to join this organization and participate in its revitalization that's going to happen at the University of Alabama. Um, the once dormant society's membership quickly grew to over 300 dues paying members. Owen had built the lobbying machine necessary to push for the archival legislation uh, that he wanted. While Owen deserves a lot of credit for his dogged determination and organizational skill, he also greatly benefited from broader changes happening in American society. The 1890s, even Alabama, had been a period of enormous labor unrest and growing political radicalism in the midst of an era of enormous American territorial expansion. From this period of unrest arose the idea that government could be used as a force of change in American society. While in some circles progressivism called for the expansion of voting rights for women and better labor conditions for workers, progressivism also provided justification for the rise of Alabama's Jim Crow laws. Government needed to regulate race relations and at times could be used to unleash government actions that introduced, uh, that reinforced traditional beliefs. History during this period was often seen as a tool that could be wielded to justify Jim Crow segregation, the past treatment of Native Americans, and the continued need for pa a patriarchal society and political institutions in Alabama. In this context, the government-funded archives could play a central role in providing the evidence for these contradictory sort of progressive ideals. You know, um, you know, basically, you know, the archive became an institutional kind of defense designed to sometimes bolster conservatism and bolster tradition in the face of all of these changing sort of ideas. You know, lost cause folks are looking for evidence at this point, and the archives is a great place to kind of build that to some degree. Um, Oh, and just to kind of point out the obvious, you know, it's no coincidence that the Alabama Archives is founded in 1901, the same year that Alabama passes the 1901 Constitution, which is widely known as the most racist constitution in America in many degrees. So, um, you know, so one of Owen's greatest uh, attributes was his ability to transform his personal passionate interest in history into a call of action message that appealed to a broad range of white male citizens and elected officials who are increasingly looking toward the state to assume a more active role in society. He was a master lobbyist, basically. Timing was crucial, but not accidental to Owen's strategy. During the mid-1890s, a growing number of white Alabamians organized to celebrate and commemorate their Confederate heritage. Uh, 
In 1889, the United Confederate Veterans formed. In 1894, I should have these in better order, but the United Daughters of the Confederacy was created. Oh, I do have them in order. A few years later, in 1896, the Sons of Confederate Veterans were formed. Um, all had Alabama chapters almost immediately. Uh, and Owen became heavily involved in all of these and eventually rose to leadership positions in all of these. Hundreds of white men joined immediately, and soon the organization's roster swelled to the thousands. Owen and his father-in-law, John Bankhead, a Confederate veteran, this is one thing they could agree upon, really, played significant roles in the Confederate in Alabama's Confederate Heritage Organizations. Ray Bankhead Owen also was a major leader in the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Owen skillfully used these heritage groups and, re and the reborn Alabama Historical Society to form a powerful lobby. As Owen called for state funds to be dedicated to survey the state records so the recommendation could be made about what to do with these resources, he explicitly talked about how such a survey would gather enormous amounts of material associated with Alabama's Confederate past. He also skillfully hinted that any future gathering of paper materials would also include material objects like rifles, uniforms, cannon, and other objects associated with the Civil War. In other words, he had huge interest. He was interested way more in Civil War, but he knew politically, if you focus in on Civil War, that's how you're going to get your archives funded, and that's exactly what he did. Um, Owens Alabama Historical Society also lobbied the state legislature for funds to erect a Confederate monument on the north lawn of the Capitol building. The bill passed with little opposition and brought more attention to the society. As that monument was being prepared for its public unveiling, Owen and his legislative supporters who he had stacked in his Alabama Historical Society, purposely gave like free memberships to any legislator who wanted to join, and he definitely got them, introduced two bills calling for funding of a state survey and the creation of an Alabama Historic Commission to make recommendations on what to do with that survey. Caught up in the wave of Confederate pride and seeing a clear link between Owen's record survey and the state's celebrated Confederate past, both bills passed the Alabama House with minimal opposition. The next day, Alabama Governor Thomas Jones unveiled the state Confederate monument before a large crowd. During his speech, Jones told the audience that, quote, our duty is not ended with the unveiling of this monument. Our new duty is to build an archives of the state, basically, to preserve the records associated with this history. The very next uh, two days later, Alabama Senate goes into session. They vote unanimously to pass uh, Owens' bill and inst initiate the surveys that are going to create the Alabama archives. And 19, so Owen spends, you know, about a year and a half or so um, compiling information and creating this massive survey that is a really amazing document. I forgot to bring it up here, but, you know, if you ever look, it's all online and so forth. But the document is an amazing kind of snapshot of Alabama's historical records in about 1899 or so. Um, what he does is he lists not only his own collections, but all the collections that are held in private hands throughout the state. He um, goes and does a pretty extensive survey of courthouses to find what kind of records are available in courthouses, what newspapers have survived in Alabama. Some are in his possession, some are in other possession. Um, and then he also um, starts identifying there historic sites, pieces of art. Um, there's even a small brief bit of sort of like folk culture, even pottery, things like that. All of these are like cultural resources of the state of Alabama. They compiles into what looks like a pretty mundane government report, but when you scan through it, it's really a great snapshot of where Alabama was at the time and what kinds of materials he would use to find. So this survey is critical because the survey proves that there's stuff out there. Um, for years, the Alabama legislature had been telling Owen that nobody cares about history. Nobody wants this archive that you talk about. There's no interest in this stuff. Well, the survey proved without a doubt that people have thousands of collections in their own personal possession that they greatly, deeply care about. And then he got uh, basically contact information and permissions from many of them that said if an archive was created, they'd be glad to donate these materials to be preserved in a central institution. Um, so all of that kind of combines together to help create the Alabama archives in 1901. Uh, when they go back to get the archives created, there's virtually no opposition to it at all because Owen has done such a good uh, job. Owen's conception of archives is critical to its current uh, activities, however. He envisioned the archi an archives that was an archives, a library, a museum, a publishing house, an art gallery. Um, he had 
huge ambitions. And, you know, I mean, many of you are familiar with what they do here, and some of you may be familiar with what other states do in archives, but, you know, state archives are very different across the nation. Um, I'm from Georgia. In Georgia, we don't, by and large, do a lot of programs like this. Uh, Georgia doesn't have a museum as part of its archive, you know, things like that. Why do we have those things in Alabama? A lot of it's because this was Tom Owen's vision from the start. And the legislation that was put passed to create this place allowed an enormous amount of room to kind of do uh, what they, they felt was needed at the time. Um, so, you know, he built this massive collection quickly, developed small museum exhibits, you know, almost instantly. Um, oops. I'm going to keep it there. Uh, Native American collections were large parts of his activities. I mean, in 1909, he co-founds the Alabama Anthropological Society. I mean, that organization conducts a number of field excavations statewide. Uh, much of the material made its way into ADH's collections. Owen's views of Native Americans was deeply influenced by an American imperialistic age they lived in. He saw Native Americans sometimes as uncivilized savages who benefited from white territorial expansion because such movements introduced Christianity, patriarchy, and civilization to Alabama. Owen tended to see the artifacts they collect as evidence of an inferior race at times rather than pieces of their advanced culture. Most notably, much like his contemporaries, he made no effort to connect Alabama's Native Americans past with Native Americans currently living. I mean, he actually frequently, in even federal documents, referred to them as if they're extinct, you know, this extinct civilization that's moved on. Owen's early collections are broad, but honoring the Confederacy remained at the forefront. Almost immediately after the archive was created, largely because he's going to go back and ask for more from the state legislature, he starts pinning thousands of letters to Confederate veterans all throughout the state of Alabama, which he was able to get lists of because they're issuing pensions for Confederates by this point, asking for them to submit memoirs, you know, to submit their information about their time in the war. He also went out of his way to collect Confederate battle flags, many of which have been captured up north, um, you know, and he really Really kind of made the Civil War kind of the central focal point of what he was doing there. Um, he also had an interest in Alabama's pioneer generation. He worked hard to gather those materials. But unfortunately, like most archival collections at the time, he showed almost no interest in documenting the lives of Alabama slaves or African Americans in general. Uh, when Auburn history professor George Petrie, for example, launched his statewide effort to gather questionnaires from former slaves, really famous study there. Owen offered minimal assistance to doing this. And in part, in the exchange of this, in part because Owen knows by doing this, he possibly threatened some of the relationship that he has with these pro-Confederates and state legislatures who have just uh, built this. And in fact, Owen does worse than that. Um, Owen plays a role. There's a magazine called The Confederate Veteran that Confederate veterans submit information to. Owen played a role. He publishes several of these kind of loyal slave narratives, basically, that, you know, there were loyal slaves who were dedicated to their former masters and dedicated to the Confederacy and, again, kind of plays to the ears of this pro-Confederate audience that Owen had kind of used to build the archives. Likewise, Owen, you know, he's a staunch Democrat, paid little attention to materials associated with the state's failed populist movement or items connected with Alabama widespread labor unrest during the 1890s and early 20th century. It's really important to see Owen as a Democrat. His dad's a big-time Democrat. His brother-in-law is a big-time Democrat. And in many ways, Owen in the archives comes of age at a time in which that Democratic supremacy is being challenged in Alabama, and there's a harsh backlash against those who have challenged it. And Owens, in many ways, uses the archives as sort of a scientific way of, of proving this democratic supremacy um, in there. Um, despite these shortcomings, you know, Owen nonetheless achieved something no one else had accomplished up to this point. He secured state funding for the creation of an independent Department of Archives. While the achievement alone is quite noteworthy, perhaps his broader success might have been the infrastructure that he built that made all of this possible. I mean, sure, he's flawed to a certain degree. We can talk all day about prejudices and things like that, but he built the institutions. He built these, all the historical societies around the state that flourish right after the archives is founded, the rising interest in archives, public discussions like we're having today. Owens arranged hundreds of these in private homes and in even government buildings around the state, all of that is born out of Tom Owen's kind of work, and that stuff continues on into an age where at least some of that racist past starts to get 
ditched, at least, at least we hope. Um, you know, it's difficult to find any organization in Alabama whose mission is to preserve and promote our state's cultural resources that lacks a direct connection to Tom Owen. While Owen was certainly ADH's founder, he might also be considered the founder of public history and public archaeology in Alabama as well. All right, thank you all. Y'all have a great afternoon.